Hi, Krishya. Good to have you online. And uh, good morning to those of you who are here in the class. So we'll get started. OK, we have four Old Testament books left. Um, so today we were supposed to do Zephaniah and Haggai. But I do not want to cover Zephaniah with Haggai, because Haggai and Zechariah have a lot in common. Uh, they both have a similar theme. So today we will look at Zephaniah and Malachi. And tomorrow we'll deal with uh, uh, Haggai and Zechariah, because they both have a uh, similar theme. So today we are now starting off with Zephaniah. And uh, just to give a little background about who Zephaniah is, uh, one of the most familiar kings of uh, you know, uh, southern Judah was Hezekiah, because he was a godly man. And um, uh, you know, th there are good things that happened during his reign. So Hezekiah, of course, had many sons. Now, the main uh, heir to the throne was, of course, Manasseh. But apart from Manasseh, he also had many other sons. So uh, Manasseh was probably the oldest. Uh, there was also another son named Amariah. So uh, Manasseh gives birth to the next king, who is called Amon. And as we know, both Manasseh and Amon were very wicked and evil kings. Uh, we do learn in Second Chronicles chapter 32 that Manasseh repents of his sinfulness and he commits himself to the Lord you know, later on in life. Uh, um, but his son, Amon, when he comes to the throne, he is completely evil. Uh, in fact, he gets assassinated after just two years of being on the throne. So these are some of the things that we see happening through uh, Manasseh's lineage. So you have Hezekiah giving birth to Manasseh, and Manasseh gives birth to Amon, and Amon's son is Josiah. That is the way the lineage works. And as we know, because you know, Amon gets assassinated just after two years of being on the throne. Uh, when uh, Josiah is, is placed on the throne, he's just an eight-year-old child. Uh, so basically, someone else would have been taking care of the administration while the boy uh, grows up. So it's around 16 years of age that Josiah you know, starts to take an active interest in godly things and also probably probably starts you know, learning how to take on the administration and the royal uh, role and all of that. So all of these things are happening uh, through Manasseh's uh, lineage. On the other hand, as we know, he Man um, Hezekiah also had many other sons. So one of his other sons was someone named Amariah. And Amariah gives birth to um, Gedaliah. And uh, the grandson of Gedaliah is this person that we are talking about, Prophet Zephaniah. So Zephaniah was a part of the uh, royal extended family. Uh, he's not just someone who came from a you know a prophetic background or a priestly background. He came from a royal background. So um, age-wise, they probably were almost the same age. Not exactly sure how that works out because technically speaking, Zephaniah belongs to one generation younger than Josiah, but you know, depending on who married whom at what age and on depending on when they finally had a baby. Uh, so because of all of those uh, you know, uh, factors which are involved, uh, at least age-wise, it looks like Zephaniah and Josiah would probably have been almost the same age. Josiah probably was a little older. Uh, but uh, if you're looking in terms of the number of generations involved, um, Josiah would be um, the great grandson of Hezekiah. So Hezekiah's great grandson would be Josiah. On the other hand, Zephaniah would be a great great grandson. Okay, so uh, those are just the details. Um, so uh, Zephaniah, being such a godly person uh, and you know having that call of God upon his life, he might have played a role in influencing Josiah because. In his early childhood, we don't see any indications of Josiah being godly. But then by the time he reaches 16 years of age, 
that is when he really begins to take the things of god very seriously so who knows you know zephaniah might have played a role in the spiritual growth of josiah okay so um that could be possible and uh, so about 20 years are now left for judah to fall you know for jerusalem to be captured so in the last 20 years is when Zephaniah is doing his ministry and is prophesying. He's telling people, even now it is not too late if you would only like to listen you know, to, to what God is saying. So that is when he begins prophesying. About 20 years before the fall of Jerusalem, he starts his prophecies. Uh, about eight years after he begins his prophecies, uh, Josiah dies. We, we covered that, I think, in the last class, uh, the foolishness of Josiah. Uh, he goes to fight against uh, Pharaoh Necho when there was no need to do that. Pharaoh Necho, in fact, says to him, God is asking me to go and do, uh, you know, fight this battle. Why are you standing in my way? And yet Josiah chooses to disguise himself, enter into the battle, and he, you know, gets uh, himself killed. So Josiah basically dies 12 years before the capture. Just Je Zephaniah has started his ministry 20 years before the fall of um, uh, or capture of Jerusalem. Uh, so um, these are the, you know, this is the timeline that we can kind of approximately get. Looking at the book itself, the book of Zephaniah, uh, just to have a brief idea of the structure, uh, all the three chapters are mainly talking about the judgment on the day of the Lord, the terrible judgment that is going to come upon the land. In the last portion of chapter three, you know, the about 10 or 11 verses is basically where there is hope offered, uh, where um, you know God speaks about how he will restore Israel one day. But otherwise, most of the three chapters are mainly about judgment. Uh, he, he arranges the judgments in an alternate manner. He first of all starts by talking about universal judgment. That would be chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 is universal judgment. Then 1, 4 to 2, 3 will be judgment upon Judah. Then again, after talking about Judah, he goes back to the other nations. He talks about judgment upon different nations in chapter 2, verses 4 to 15. Among those verses, you also have you know, the prophecy about Nineveh falling. Um, so maybe we could actually read out that particular uh, verse, simply because we have already talked about Nineveh, how Nineveh fell, all of those details. So if someone could read out uh, Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 13. Yes. The uh, name will be utterly desolate and it will become as dry as a desert. And we also talked about how this was true, uh, how uh, people, you know, the archaeologists could not even discover Nineveh until, uh, you know, in the 19th century. So, um, so he begins by giving uh, words of universal judgment. Then he talks a little bit about judgment upon Judah. Then he moves into judgment upon the surrounding nations. And next again, he comes back to words of judgment upon uh, Jerusalem. And finally, in the end, um, you know, chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, he talks about how the nations will be judged and how the nations will also be cleaned by the Lord, how they will be cleansed by the Lord. Okay, so uh, that's the portion. And then finally, he comes into the last section where some words of restoration are offered. Uh, maybe we could look at one of those. Uh, chapter 3, verse 20, if someone could read out. Hmm. Yes, so uh, the last few verses end with hope, where God says, one day, even though you are in a pathetic condition now, I will honor you in that in the in that last, uh, you know, in those last days, is what um, Zephaniah says through the Lord. Mm. Coming to maybe one or two passages that we can quickly look at. Uh, if if we if someone could read out chapter one. Verses 4 to 6. Zephaniah 1, 4 to 6. Let me stretch out my hand against the hand against all 
Yeah, that that the that's should be enough. So we see that uh, Zephaniah is prophesying and saying that the people have turned back from following the Lord. They're not following him anymore. He says they do not seek the Lord nor inquire of him. So whom are they seeking for guidance? Whom are they going to for inquiring? You know uh, about what to do, what decision to take. They are doing all this inquiring on their rooftops. It's explained that they are worshipping the stars of heaven, the constellations, and basing all their decisions on the way those stars are arranged. They are basically using astrology for their decision making. They are not turning to the Lord. That is the way they are living. Also, what, what else are they doing? They are bowing down and swearing by the Lord, you know, as if, as if they are honoring God and they are worshipping Him. But at the same time, they are also swearing by Molech. This um, uh, some versions will say Melcom, some versions will say Molek. This is basically your um, um, uh, pagan god of fire. So it is it is basically to this pagan god of fire that you know they would offer human sacrifices, babies to be put in that fire to be burnt and roasted because that is that you know makes the demons happy. So that's basically what was going on. So all of this was very very terrible in God's eyes. And he was speaking out words of prophecy against these people. Uh, so which means at this point of time, Zef jo Josiah has not yet started his work of revival and reformation. So this must be during the early years of his rule, you know, where um, um, he has not yet had that um, encounter with the Lord, which, you know, we started his transformation process. So in the early years of Josiah's rule, the same things which had been happening, you know, in the time of Amon. And of course, in the time of Manasseh, for a while, he stops all of that. Once he repents, his repentance was true, not a fake repentance. Uh, not like those people of Nineveh who only lasted a few years. Um, this man, Manasseh, he does try to remove all of those practices. But then his son, Amon, brings everything back. And so um, a lot of uh, worship to this fire god of Molech, a lot of uh, babies being murdered. All of this is going on in the land, and uh, Zephaniah is speaking out against all of those things. So he probably had a very uh, in great influence on Josiah. Josiah's change in transformation is coming to the Lord, and then you know he Josiah goes to the extent of bringing about a revival in the entire land. So Zephaniah probably had a part to play in all of these things. Um, yeah. Uh, some of the okay yeah we we, we don't we won't get into the details of um, the kind of idol worship that was going on uh, but yeah there are all kinds of details regarding that um maybe if someone could read out zephaniah chapter 2 verse 4 Okay, here there is a judgment being brought against one of the, uh, you know, surrounding areas which are not at not under the control of uh, Judah right now. So um, Zephaniah is prophesying, and he says these are the things which God will do. Uh, Gaza will be completely abandoned; it will be completely deserted. Ashkelon will be completely reduced to ruins. Uh, because you know um, that place will be judged, uh, and as for Ashdod, you know by midday it will be emptied. Basically, that's just a figure of speech. It means that very very quickly, you know, before the day even ends, very very quickly Ashdod will be emptied out, 
and then uh, also a place named Ekron is mentioned and how that place will be uprooted. Now, these are all areas which are, you know, if you were to mention these places to someone living in Jerusalem at that time, they would immediately know those names. You're talking about places which are like just very immediately around the Jerusalem region. And the nice thing is that because Josiah really completely 101% sets his heart on the Lord, once he begins his walk with God, he, there's no looking back. He is uh, completely committed. So because of what of the attitude of Josiah, we see that some of these places actually come back to Judah right now. You know, Ze Zephaniah is literally speaking out the prophecies. And as he is speaking, these things are actually beginning to happen. So right in the lifetime of Josiah himself, he sees some of these places being brought back to his kingdom. He's able to, you know, um, uh, conquer these places and bring them back. How do we know that? Uh, because archaeologists have found a written record uh, where somewhere near the fortress of Ashdod. Now, when you, uh, when based on that written record, we discover that a Judahite governor had been appointed over that area. So why is a Judahite governor being appointed? It means that Josiah was victorious in his battle in bringing that place back into Judah's uh, fold. He was able to succeed in doing that. So we get to know that Ashdod and the areas all around Ashdod have now come back to Judah because of that, of that you know, uh, archaeological record which was found. Um, um, they, the archaeologists call those things ostracons. That's just basically a clay plate, a clay tablet on which, you know, there's a record of, you know, who is the king at that time. So obviously Josiah is the king and it says who is the governor and the name of the Judahite governor is given. All of those details are there on that uh, thing which was discovered. Uh, also, uh, another detail that, you know, we get because of historical records. Um, Mm, okay, just to go back a little bit, uh, you know, so that we'll have, we'll get an understanding of what we are saying. Uh, Hezekiah, if you remember, uh, he stopped the Assyrians when they became powerful. They came and tried to attack all the places, uh, along with all the other kingdoms which are giving tribute to Assyria. Hezekiah also starts giving tribute, but then after a while, he stops. And then when he stops giving a tribute, uh, the Assyrian king Senna Sherib is very, very angry. He, you know, uh, anyway, he's already had victory over the northern kingdom. You know, nicely, he's, you know, he's managed to wipe out the northern kingdom. So he comes to the southern kingdom and he, in fact, um, takes many of the cities, but he's not able to touch Judah because of the story that we know, right? I mean, he's not able to touch Jerusalem, sorry. He, he takes many cities of Judah, but he's unable to touch Jerusalem in particular because, you know, Hezekiah, we remember, right? He goes before the, uh, to the temple of God and he puts down that letter which has been written and says, Lord, look, this is the threat that they are making. Now you have to help us. If you remember all those details. So um, at that particular time, um, many of the cities were captured except for Jerusalem which Senna Sherib could not touch. So among the other Judahite cities which were captured, a lot of people were taken away as slaves. Uh, so a lot of the uh, you know, you know, people of Judah were turned into slaves by Senna Sherib, and they were made to work in different places. One of the places where they were made to work was over here in Ekron, you know, where it says in the prophecy, Ekron will be uprooted, it says. So Ekron was the place where a lot of these people who had been captured uh, from the other cities, they were taken as slaves and they were made to work in Ekron as uh, slaves in the olive oil fields. Okay, That area was filled with olive oil fields and the Assyrians were using them uh, to uh, you know, take care of all their labor. We get to know this through records which have been found over there You know, in that um in that region and uh, so if josiah was successful in taking over ashdod it most probably means that he was also able to set free all those slaves who were working in ekron 
because you see all these things are mentioned in one single place it says at midday ashdod will be emptied and ekron uprooted so maybe if, if the entire area of ashdod and the surrounding regions have now been taken over and he has placed a judahite governor over there chances are that even ekron also he was able to successfully uproot and he, he probably set free all the slaves who were in that place so there were spiritual victories which began to come the minute josiah set his heart on the lord and began to follow him okay so all along uh, through all of these prophets god went on promising and saying even now if you will change your ways even now if you will repent and come back to me see what i will do none of the kings were interested in seeing what god what god can do but here you have one man who said okay fine lord i want to follow you and then you know right he discovers that scroll which had you know which had been lost for so many centuries he finds it in the temple when he starts reading it and seeing that he has not even followed half the commandments given over there he tears his robes and this is the judgment of god is going to come upon me oh my goodness i need to you know change my ways he he starts sending messengers all over the country and saying you know what this is what yahweh expects us to do and we have not even been doing this let us start doing it now that is the heart of repentance that this man has where he genuinely wants to follow the lord and then god shows what he can do see imagine in another 20 years uh, jerusalem is going to be wiped out because god's judgment will come but just 20 years before the judgment you could just say happily going one place after another capturing it bringing it back i mean look at the way god blesses even in the midst of judgment even in the midst of you know impending destruction the righteous god will take care of so it's all depends on what kind of a walk you wish to have with the lord so whatever god has said will happen will happen god said the end times will come god said there will be persecution god said that there will be trials so yes all of those things will be there and you know if we if we are serving the lord we too will be impacted uh, we too will be persecuted but even in the middle of it we will see god's hand of faithfulness in an amazing manner and we will marvel and say oh my even in this terrible times look at the way god is taking care of his people so we will of course see persecution but we will also see an amazing hand of provision an amazing hand of blessing and protection in spite of all the things that are going on we see that even in the early church they were getting arrested they were getting beaten up we also see miracles where people were just walking out of prison you know without any any permission no nobody gave any permission god opened the gates they walked out of the gate so you will see persecution happening but you will also see amazing works of god because god's hand is with his people so here we see josiah achieving great things in a time when uh, you know destruction is almost upon them because of his faithfulness towards god now uh, zephaniah is one prophet who talks about you know um, the you know we we talked about right we you know, when we talked about the structure of zephaniah in the very beginning he starts off by talking about the universal judgment which will come in the end times on the day of the lord um, maybe we could actually read out those verses zephaniah chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 Okay, so um, here it's talking about the end times when God will wipe out everything, including it says over here the birds and the and the fish and the beasts, all of it, all of it will be wiped out. And uh, generally, what people say is, you know, what does God have against the animal life? Why is He attacking the animals? Why couldn't He have just spared them? Uh, but uh, what they fail to understand is the spiritual aspect of what's going on. when uh, humans began to sin and they brought sin and death into the world it's not just human beings who were corrupted even all of creation was stained and contaminated by sin because of what the humans had done and uh, so 
even the animals and the birds they also are contaminated by the sinfulness which man has brought into the world so they are actually innocent victims but they are contaminated by sin so in the end time god is going to be wrapping up everything because you know all of this which is contaminated and stained needs to be wiped out and then he will bring in this new you know the new heaven and the new earth where they where there will be no longer any corruption or contamination it will be completely pure completely holy so for him to bring in that he first has to remove this whatever is left over and uh, you know we see that god's ideal was never for you know creation to be uh, corrupted by sin right because that is why uh, when jesus christ comes for his the uh, for you know to rule in the millennium kingdom when he takes over for those 1000 years when satan is you know tied up and he can he can't do anything for those 1000 years god shows what he originally had in mind when he put his creation you know on the earth and even in the garden of eden uh because in those in in that 1000 years the animals start behaving the way they were meant to behave when they were first created when god first made the animals and birds and said it is good at that time they were meant to live in a very different way but because of sin they too became corrupted and even animals began to kill animals other animals and uh, you know um, they would kill humans and all of that but when we look at isaiah you know chapter 11 which talks about that we see that originally when god created uh, beasts and birds and fish they were never meant to be attacking other birds and beasts and fish it was never that was never god's plan maybe we could actually just look at that isaiah chapter 11 verses 7 to 9 it says here that they will neither harm nor destroy okay that was god's idea nobody would be harming anyone no one would be destroying anyone else so you would basically have the cow and the bear you know eating together they are not trying to kill each other of course the cow can't kill the bear uh, but the bear of course will you know has the power to do that so it says over here the cow will feed along with the bear and the cow does not have anything to be afraid of because the cow knows the bear is not going to feed on it the bear is going to find some something some vegetation to eat in fact that's clarified you know in the next phrase where it says the lion will eat straw so you will have people arguing and saying oh how the digestive system is different completely different it's not meant to be eating grass but it's grass it will die uh, so it just makes me think my goodness was the sin which humans brought into the world so terrible that it actually led to a physical reconstruction of the entire digestive system of animals isn't that terrible to think that creation got warped and um, messed up to such an extent that creatures which were meant to eat grass you know began to change to an extent where they could no longer live on vegetation but they would have to you know wreak out violence against other creatures to be able to live it's a very horrible thought so we think oh you know um, adam and eve sinned and they brought sin into the world and we don't really understand the seriousness of what they brought into the world it's something very very terrible that they did and the the spiritual implications of what they had done is just uh, too great and that is why it says before the foundation of the world it's if god prepared the lamb he knew he knew that these things are going to happen and the lamb of god will have to be slain so all this was arranged before even anything was created because god knew that what adam and eve would be would do is something that terrible i really wonder when people go up to heaven and the first look at adam and eve what their reaction is you know I mean, uh, to that couple that set off a whole bunch of events which just changed everything so yeah okay let me not get carried away let's come back to what we are looking at so zephaniah is one of the persons more than any other prophet he is the one who goes on talking about the day of the lord in the end times when once again what god wanted in the very beginning 
that will be restored okay so all that is there now will be destroyed and god will restore everything back to the way he wanted it to be originally so zephaniah talks a lot about the day of the lord coming to malachi and just because we are coming to malachi does not mean that you don't have a class tomorrow we most definitely have a class tomorrow we will be looking at haggai and zechariah but for today we will look at malachi um so um, malachi was written after these people come back from captivity the exiles have returned back home and the exiles are very happy living their own life and they are not really following the lord anymore okay uh, it's rather sad because you see they are the few people who made a commitment and came back to jerusalem they could have lived comfortably over there but they made that sacrifice they came back over here now that is the problem with the human heart it does not stay with the lord unless the lord has renewed it that is the experience which we have as believers so we can't excuse the excuse which the old testament people did they had not yet been given that heart of stone had not yet been taken away that heart of flesh which is from god had not yet been given to them so they behaved the way they did we cannot use that excuse we have uh, a, we are a new creation on the inside we have the very spirit of god on the inside so what they could do that we are simply definitely not allowed to so um, you know god is angry with them for the way they have been behaving and uh, so in the book of malachi uh, we he basically talks about their spiritual you know deterioration and he warns them and says that again a time of judgment will come upon them if they do not repent of their evil ways uh, so malachi is basically you know around the time of uh, you know ezra and nehemiah they come back they bring a lot of reforms they try to change uh, you know everything you know um set everything up nicely so that the people can you know, live com comfortably and live in god's presence but here the people are back to you know um, all kinds of disobedience um they are no longer idol worshippers that's one lesson they have learnt uh, they are they're quite a you know thick headed people and they are still uh, you know sinful but one basic fact they have understood idol worship is one thing god is not going to tolerate so irrespective of what whether other sins are being committed or not this is one thing that has now been washed out of their system okay so uh, um, however they are you know being very careless about uh their attitude and about the way they are uh, you know treating the lord uh, so it's basically those sins that uh, malachi is addressing so in uh, the book of malachi chapters 1 2 and 3 he talks about the sins which the people are doing he talks about the priests and the way they are doing their uh, priestly duties so carelessly so uninterestedly you know like a kind of routine not really honoring him respecting him um this this uh, portion where it talks about how um yeah we don't have it's all well, very lovely passages but there's no time to go into all of them so we will not uh, but yeah you know he he talks about the way the priests are um, not taking their priestly role seriously at all not honoring god in the way he should be honored and of course malachi is very very famous for the uh, entire you know teaching on tithes and offerings you know these two best friends need to be separated so i'm just assuming that they're not friends with them if one of them could come and sit over here in future then we could have some okay so um yeah where was i uh, yeah chapters 1 to 3 is he talks about the sins of the people and then uh, chapter 4 uh, is where he too talks about the great and terrible day of the lord that would be in verse 5 okay chapter 4 verse 5 he talks about the judgment of god which will come uh, so those are the basic things that we find in the structure of malachi um two very important prophecies that you know malachi is uh, well known for that would be found in your chapter 3 verses 1 to 4 so if we could have someone read out malachi chapter 3 verses 1 to 4 
Okay. Wow, these four verses are prophesying about whom? Who whom are they talking about? These four verses. Whom is um, Malachi prophesying about? Anyone else? Um, for he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. So is that John the Baptist? So there are two prophecies being, I mean, the prophecy is one. It's talking about two two people. So in verse one, we have uh, the person who will come and do the preparing of the way. So I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly, or rather in the word would be unexpectedly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. So first you'll have the messenger coming along, who of course is John the Baptist. Once the messenger prepares the way, unexpectedly when people are not expecting it the lord himself will arrive at the temple and then he will be like a refiner's fire he will point out all the defects of these pharisees and all you know who are thinking that they're very very holy so he will be like a refining fire he will point out the wrong that is there and people who are interested in repenting will turn to him you know so all of those things so over here the prophecy is about John the Baptist and the Messiah who will be coming. Okay, so both are mentioned. Um, just uh, okay, we have about eight minutes left. Anyone has any questions? So this we can yes. Hmm. 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 Noah, huh? Yes. So in the time of Noah, God makes a promise uh, saying that now onwards I will never again bring a worldwide event. Where there would be complete destruction of the entire planet. I know I would never allow that again, is the promise that God makes to Noah. Uh, and uh, so now at the end of time, when you know uh, this this entire chapter or phase of of human existence is completely finished, God keeps his promise till the end of it. And now at the end of it all, when a new era will be coming in, only then does God bring a worldwide destruction where you know everything will be wrapped up and uh, so in all the thousands of years in between god does keep his word we never again have a great flood happening we never see you know fire coming down and wiping out everything so we don't see that god does keep his word so as long as this current era has lasted god has kept his word but you know there is something more awaiting us there would be a brand new chapter where you would have a new heaven and a new earth. So, of course, uh, the promise that he makes is only for this era where you would still need sacrifices, either the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament or the sacrifice of Jesus who has come and you know completed uh, the need for any other sacrifices. All of this is the era of sin. It's, sin is still there and creation is still groaning for that time when the sons of men will be revealed, sons of man will be revealed. You know, uh, so they, all this is still going on. So in this era, God says, I will not bring about that level of judgment again. And God does keep his promise. But new era will come and there will not even be any need for any sacrifice. Because on that day, um, you know, you will have only the righteous, the Lord. And uh, there will be no sin there will be no impurity so um uh, so he keeps his covenant uh, promise which he made in that sense uh, up to the end of this current age and once the new age comes then of course he would reveal details about that at that time uh, you all of us will be there in the meeting when it happens so we can get the details at that time okay so 
Um, so just to you know uh, look at a little more details about all the things that um, Malakai is speaking about, uh, you know the uh, because in in the book of Nehemiah we get to know a little bit of detail about what these people were doing. They are no longer you know um, idol worshippers, but there are other things which they are doing, you know other sinful deeds that are going on. And, and when we look at Nehemiah chapter 13, we get a little idea of what was happening because it was around this time that Malachi was, you know, doing his um, ministry work. Uh, so if we were to look in Nehemiah chapter 13, uh, we see that uh, very clearly the book of Moses is read out. That would basically be your first five books of the Old Testament that was read out. And it's very clearly told to the people, you know, I'm looking at Nehemiah 13 verse 1. The people were very, very clearly told that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God. Obviously, of course, this is not referring to Ruth, even though Ruth is a Moabitess. So God never, ever stops someone who genuinely repents and comes to him. But rather, he's talking about people who have chosen to follow some other gods and not follow Yahweh. So such people will not be admitted into the assembly of God is what is said. So it says in verse 3, when the people heard about this, they actually remove and get rid of many of the people you know, many of the Ammonites and Moabites who were living in their land and continuing to follow those Ammonite gods and those Moabite gods, the people make a conscious effort to get rid of all of those people. But shortly after that, Nehemiah has to go back to uh, Persia. Okay, so when he goes over there on work, here the people, you know, start going back into their old habits and their old practices. So that is around the time that Malachi begins prophesying. He says what is going on over here is not correct. So what, what actually is going on? Eliashib the priest. Imagine a, at least a priest should have some sense. This Eliashib the priest, even though he's in such a responsible and important position, in fact, it, it says in verse 4, he has been placed in charge of the of the, all the storerooms of the house of God. Like we talked about. Uh, earlier the main temple of course was you know you have the whole the holy of holies then you have the holy place and then you have the courtyard where you have the altar that is your immediate central temple structure now all around that they built many many other buildings because you have to store all the grains which are brought i mean imagine how many you know tons of uh, grain is brought in every year and you have the animals which are brought in all those things need to be stored what about the people who are guarding the temple, you know, because there's gold and silver over there, right? So someone needs to guard. So the guards will be over there. Like some of them, while the guards are on duty, they would have to be living somewhere, right? They would have to have quarters. So you'll have quarters for the guards. So you have an entire uh, lot of construction work which came up around the actual main temple. So that whole thing is basically called temple complex. The entire temple complex consists not only of just the temple, immediate temple, but also of all the buildings which are around it. And all of it is considered, you know, uh, sacred ground because after all, it's all directly connected to the temple. And Eliash is in charge of a lot of, uh, a lot of the storage areas. So after Nehemiah goes back on duty, you know, back to Persia, what does this man do? Because he's in, he's in very good terms with somebody named Tobiah. If you remember when we were doing Nehemiah and Ezekiel, we looked at Tobiah and Sanbalat were the two people who created most of the problems when they were trying to reconstruct the temple and also when they were trying to build the walls. These two men are the ones who created a lot of persecution and trouble for the people. So Tobiah is one of those persons and he is an Ammonite. Eliashib is a close friend of Tobiah. You know, imagine you're a priest and you have that kind of friends. It shows, right? He never read Psalm 1, I think, because Psalm 1 very clearly says, do not walk with the, you know, wicked. Instead, you know, walk in the ways of God and meditate on his law and delight in it. But here is a man who's walking with the wicked. He's walking with people like Tobiah. And what does he do? He wants to show his love and friendship to him. He actually brings this Ammonite man and... 
he puts him in in the temple uh, in in the temple area in the storage area makes an nice quarters for him over there imagine so when nehemiah comes back he is so angry he says how could you take an ammonite and put him right here in the temple complex when it says so clearly that no ammonite or moabite should even be allowed into god's presence and so these are the kind of you know a very carelessness and indifference about the things of god had crept into the hearts of the people and that is the kind of uh, uh, lethargy spiritual laziness which malachi is addressing they're not even bothering to bring proper tithes and offerings to the temple so these are the issues which malachi addresses you know um, when he is uh, speaking judgment against the people okay so uh, there are of course many many other things mentioned uh, it talks about how they were not following the sabbath rules it of course again talks about some people who had not yet given up their wives who are still following idol worship they're still holding on to those wives all of those things are also uh, mentioned okay so nehemiah 13 gives us a little background about what exactly was going on during the time of uh, malachi all right so these are just some of the things that we could look at so tomorrow we will uh, cover haggai and zechariah because they both uh, together talk about you know why have you stopped the temple construction why are you not resuming it so it basically talks about that whole uh, temple construction uh, era you know that particular time when they were still rebuilding the a uh, new temple so uh, we'll cover those two together tomorrow so let's just close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for all the lessons that we could learn from uh, today's um, books we pray oh lord that you would help us uh, to follow the good which is there uh, and we pray that we know the the bad examples will be a warning to us and we will be careful not to be like those people Lord we thank you for uh, Zephaniah even though he was part of the royal family his heart was for you and he chose to uh, follow your calling and be a prophet and Lord because of him uh, Josiah was probably changed and his life was transformed so we pray oh Lord that we too uh, would be like Zephaniahs who will lead to the uh, spiritual growth and transformation of some person who can then bring about a mighty change we pray oh lord that we would be like malachi that one person who was raising his voice and speaking out even when all the others had grown very lazy in their spiritual walk i pray oh lord that we would uh, set a standard for those around us help us oh lord to live that kind of a life thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much uh, those of you online